Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox. I'm the Compliance Evangelist, and I'd like to welcome you to episode 66 of This Week in FCPA. For the week ending August 18, 2017, the Time to Take a Stand edition. In this week, Jay and I return for a wide-ranging discussion of some of the week's top compliance and ethics-related stories, including the SEC charges KPMG and a partner with Blown Oil and Gas Company Audit, BSRG and Benny Steinmetz raises its head again as Benny Steinmetz is detained in Israel for questioning around bribe payments in Guinea. We consider what should be the response of the compliance community to the events around uh, Charlottesville and the administration's response thereto. Jeff Kaplan takes a look at lawyers as whistleblowers, and we explore the difficulties that this could uh, cause companies. We look at a very interesting export control enforcement action involving a company trying to do business in Iran. It is a new Treasury ruling, and it certainly complicates the matter. We review Sam Rubenfeld's report. Jay takes a look at Roy Snell's reflection in the Wall Street Journal's Risk and Compliance Journal of 20 years in the compliance profession, uh, noting some of the um, changes and where the um, profession may be going. This month's uh, podcast series that I'm doing on one month to a better compliance program is in full production. In August, I'm reviewing how uh, to have greater continuous improvement in your compliance program. This week's topics for the past week included voluntary monitoring, keeping track of current events, the desktop risk assessment, using big data, and controls testing. Of course, Affiliated Monitors is this month's sponsor. It's available on the FCPA Compliance Report, iTunes, Libsyn, YouTube, and JD Supra. This Week in FCPA is a part of the Compliance Podcast Network. This is Tom Fox welcoming you to another episode of This Week in FCPA, episode 66 for the week ending August 18th, 2017, the Time to Stand edition. As always, I'm joined by my co-host and cohort, Jay Rosen, Mr. Monitors, except today he's not in Los Angeles or prestigious Encino, I should say. He is in the cradle of the U.S., revolutionary movement, Boston, Massachusetts, back to his roots. So, Jay, uh, I guess I'll turn right instead of left and say welcome. Thanks, Tom. It's uh, it's great to be back east, and it's it's nice to be on this podcast at 11 a.m. Eastern instead of 8 a.m. Pacific. But uh, no matter where we are in the world or what time zone we're in, uh, we always have some interesting stuff to talk about on a Friday, and I would say this is one of the more interesting Fridays we've had thus far this year. I would agree. So why don't we just hop right into it, Jay? Um, uh, Dick Casson over at the FCPA blog had a post about a Securities and Exchange Commission enforcement action against KPMG and a partner who blew a uh, oil and gas audit by uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, inflating the value uh, where a company had in engaged in accounting fraud to inflate the value of uh, assets by more than four hundred uh, million dollars, and the KPMG uh, auditor failed to properly audit the statements of the company. So this was uh, really interesting, Jay, because we rarely have, and I mean very rarely, individual enforcement actions against auditing firms or auditors for uh, uh, basically making mistakes in audits and. The, um, in the press release, uh, the SEC noted that both KPMG and the auditor, one John Reardon, didn't adequately consider and address facts known to them that should have raised serious doubts about the company's valuation. And then they failed to detect certain fixed assets were double counted in the company's valuations. The um, auditing firm must fully comprehend the industries of their clients and where uh, this kind of fits into FCPA and compliance, Jay, is uh, internal auditors and external auditors are a part of both the detect and prevent prongs. And they may not be on the front lines of the defenses uh, like our clients uh, tend to be, but they are part of the, the defense against bribery and corruption. So companies... Um, Shareholders, investors, and others need assurance that when an auditing firm signs off, that they have, uh, you know, adequately gone through the professional requirements of an audit. Doesn't mean they have to find everything, and certainly uh, the standards perhaps are different on materiality 
um, on a regular audit than the FCPA. Nevertheless, uh, auditors, uh, both internal auditors and external, such as KPMG, are a part of the defense against bribery and corruption. And the SEC uh, administrative order makes clear uh, their role and that they need to do that with uh, professionalism uh, and expertise going forward. What do you think about the amount of the fine? So um, I really uh, was not clear how that uh, precise amount got uh, uh, calculated. Uh, Nevertheless, um, there was a disgorgement of 4.6, which were the audit fees. There was an interest payment of five five eight hundred thousand, and then a million dollar penalty. So the largest part uh, in this enforcement action, as in most, was the profit disgorgement. The um, the fine itself was a million dollars, and then the individual auditor, audit partner, John Reardon, paid a twenty five thousand dollar penalty and is suspended from practicing or appearing before the SEC as an accountant. Uh, this bars him from participating in the financial reporting or audits of public companies. So, uh, depending on where he might be in his career, that could be a significant uh, uh, career penalty for Mr. Reardon. So, we're, I'm still uh, living in a post chicken chip club world. Right. And that book weighs heavily on my mind. Uh, in there, we saw several instances of situations where big five or big four firms <clears throat> were potentially involved with um, situations of misstating financials. Any thoughts on uh, how this KPMG uh, ruling compares vis-a-vis with what happened to Arthur Anderson and any of those other uh, precursor matters? Well, uh, in Arthur Anderson, the biggest sanction was actually the shareholder actions. Uh, brought against uh, the firm uh, for, uh, I guess they weren't around after uh, for an in-run shareholder action, but WorldCom was certainly a, another disaster for Arthur Anderson. So the sanction there was really the downfall of the firm as opposed to the strength or amount of the penalty. Okay. So uh, I think my perception is that this is definitely a positive that you're holding uh outside auditors to more uh, stringent rules. And I, I too like your takeaway about the fact that if you're working on a matter, you, you need to be a subject matter expert and you need to understand in this case how, um, you know, potential uh, energy assets were being valued. And uh, it sounds like what the facts of this case were that there was a real uh, hyperinflation of something that cost um, uh, on the very low end and then came in uh, that they inflated the assets up to a valuation of almost $400 million. Correct again. Uh, cool. Next up, we have a uh, reappearance of uh, someone who's been uh, was in the news quite a bit for potential FCPA violations. Benny Steinmetz, who is um, runs the uh, Israeli company BSRG, uh, they had a fair amount of negative publicity uh, around their uh, obtaining of mineral rights in Equatorial Guinea um, a few years back. That sort of quieted down, but uh, Israeli um, uh, uh, prosecutor prosecutors detained Steinmetz uh, this week for questioning in connection with bribery of high-ranking foreign officials in Guinea, not equatorial Guinea, I'm sorry, just regular Guinea. The police action was part of a joint investigation with Switzerland, the U.S., and Romania. And an interesting twist, it turns out that Mr. Steinmetz's family is connected with the Kushner family in uh, certain investments. So, uh, um, Perhaps the BSRG matter is moving towards some sort of uh, resolution or um, uh, uh, other um, type of action uh, in the uh, allegations of bribery in Kine, but it's certainly been a fascinating case. We could uh, dedicate an entire issue or episode to it, but this is the first time we've seen um, uh, detention for questioning, I believe. Agreed. So we had a um, interesting article by our good friend Jeff Kaplan 
uh, who is uh, a columnist for the SCCE magazine. He writes in Kaplan's Court. It's, uh, I'm also privileged to be a columnist for the magazine. Uh, but Jeff wrote about the uh, always tricky issue of lawyers as whistleblowers, and he reviewed the Biorad Laboratories uh, wrongful termination action brought by the former general counsel who was awarded more than $14 million in back wages, punitive damages, and attorney's fees under the whistleblower protections of Dodd-Frank's and Sarbanes-Oxley in connection with his being discharged for the company by the company for raising concerns to the audit committee about a possible FCPA violation. The um, uh, company was in the middle, in the throes. Biorad was in the throes of an FCPA violation when the uh, general counsel brought forward uh, new allegations or different allegations that were being, uh, that were being invest, that, uh, than those that were being investigated. The, the lawyer's name was Sanford Wadler, and he was uh, terminated. The company claimed that he was terminated for basically allowing their uh, underlying FCPA violations uh, to occur, but uh, we rarely give out HR pointers on this podcast, Jay, but I will give one here. If you backdate a employee review to put in negative information after the employee has filed a uh, whistleblower action against you, you're going to lose. And um, that's what Biorad did. After they fired him, they tried to go back and paper it up, and the jury saw through that. Uh, so, you know, pointer, uh, practice pointer for those uh, in the HR, do not go back and uh, try to uh, – Justify your termination after the fact. It's pretty clear evidence that uh, you've made something up. So um, it's an interesting case. In many ways, I find this actually pretty troubling. Nevertheless, I think this is where the law is going. It will be some abrogation of the attorney-client privilege, uh, and no one's going to know more um, dirty laundry in your company than a general counsel. So we'll have to see how it plays out. But kudos to Jeff Kaplan for uh, his article Uh, Jeff's a great speaker on the conflict of interest. He has a conflict of interest blog. It's one that you should put on your daily reading list. Good stuff. So now uh, we're going to, we've been looking at anniversaries over the past couple weeks and we looked at um, the FCPA blogs anniversary, your anniversary with going over um, 2000 blog posts and uh, in the wall street journal on August 16th, our, good friend of the podcast, uh, Ben Pietro had an interview with Roy Snell, who is uh, going to be stepping down from his post as head of the Society of Corporate Compliance and Ethics. So uh, this is going to be a, a very uh, orderly transition with the uh, individual who was ultimately selected will come in will serve as uh, the CEO of the organization for a year, and then Roy will turn things over. So uh, Roy and Ben discussed um, what are some of the biggest uh, changes in the compliance industry in the past 20 years or so, and um, you know what Roy has seen and I think what you and I have seen as well, Tom, is there's much more an awareness of the compliance industry uh, there's been a, a certain uh, professionalization and sophistication brought about. There are now universities where uh, people can go and get a degree and, and study about ethics and compliance. So I think uh, the the knowledge is out there. Uh, there are individuals who are getting it, and you know now what the challenge is is how do we exactly. Um, take what you often refer to as how do we distill compliance down into daily business activities. And I think as the, um, you know, the role as the chief compliance officer is further enmeshed in uh, corporate America. And uh, if that CCO person or CECO person uh, has the appropriate tools and has direct reporting to the uh, audit committee, um, you know, I, I think that's going to be the changes that will even happen in the next five years. So, uh, you know, Roy has always been a great trailblazer, and um, I believe applications are due at the end of the month. Is that right? Uh, actually, I think they were due at the end of July. Oh, did you get yours in? You know, um, I'm not quite sure it made it. 
Okay. Well, I got a day job, so I can't do it. Right. Right. <laughs> so um, it's interesting. I thought the uh, the period had ended, but um, for application, nevertheless, uh, there was a couple of things that I really that struck me that uh, he said. Roy is always great with turning a phrase, um, but the one I noted, Jay, was uh, uh, in partly in response to what will be the biggest issues your successor will face. Roy said, continued growth and managing revenues and expenses. In addition, potential internationality is very interesting. We aren't herding cats here. We are herding lions. And I really had not thought Love about it. that, but um, it's, I think, pretty prescient that uh, it's not that um, necessarily strong-willed people, but there certainly is that. It's just that we have a, a very high talent level really across, certainly across the United States and across the globe as well. I work with lots of uh, international uh, compliance uh, gurus and mavens. So um, uh, I've never really thought about trying to herd lions, but uh, that may be part of uh, what Roy, uh, Roy has to do and, frankly, why he has more gray hair than, uh, than I do. So um, but it's a great interview. Uh, it's in the uh, – Risk and Compliance Journal at the uh, on the Wall Street Journal uh, online site. We're certainly going to link to it uh, in the show notes. Jay, we've got a, a case that um, I sort of uh, think of as a good catch-22, and not that we need levity this week, uh, and certainly not a, a penalty of two, over $250,000 is not levity, but uh, this is really a, a catch-22, a U.S. company that uh, had the ability uh, – to legally do business with Iranian companies, so they weren't doing anything illegal, um, hired a company to do due diligence on their Iranian uh, partners. And they were fined for performing, having the due diligence performed. So the question is um, that you could, uh, can you do really do business in Iran if you don't know who you're doing business with? If you go down that road, are you violating some other law, i.e. the FCPA? Uh, there was an article in the, um, once again, Sam Rubenfeld in Risk and Compliance Journal uh, wrote about it, and he quoted a lawyer, Cliff Burns from Brian Cave, who said uh, in a post on his blog site, Export Law Blog, that the Treasury had unnecessarily concocted a theory which effectively repeals the general license allowing certain businesses in Iran certain business in Iran by foreign subsidiaries of U.S. companies, and it substantially increases the risk that U.S. companies will be fined for what they thought were legal activities of those subsidiaries. So it's a pretty anomalous situation. Uh, one might say that's uh, what you would expect for the government. Um, on the one hand, to say, well, you can do business this way uh, under law A, but under law B, it's illegal. So, um, uh, something that export control lawyers and export control compliance practitioners were gonna, are going to have to uh, navigate with the current sanctions and the current administration. <clears throat> really, uh, who knows where that may go other than uh, I would just suggest people take an eye on it. So, Jay, um, maybe if we could spend a little bit of time now about um, – kind of the events in Charlotte last weekend and the administration's response and what should be the response of the compliance community. Uh, yesterday, the uh, ECI released a statement that I thought was uh, pretty powerful, uh, uh, emphasizing the um, dedication to the rule of law and, and to the compliance profession and the com uh, compliance community that as compliance practitioners, we needed to uh, reiterate and uh, reaffirm our views of what compliance is, what business ethics is, and uh, even if we're not uh, going to be out protesting uh, the uh, Nazis and white uh, nationalists uh, who march, that we can certainly protest uh, and take a stand by doing so at our corporations and reaffirming our corporate values to inclusion, to equality, and the uh, uh, the values of corporate America that many CEOs spoke about this week uh, themselves. So uh, I wrote about it today in a uh, blog post called Time for Compliance to Take a Stand. Matt Kelly wrote about it in a blog post called Trump Tests Corporate America's Values. 
Matt and I uh, explored the issue in some depth on uh, this week's episode of uh, Compliance Into the Weeds. And as I said, there was a statement from the uh, yeah, Ethics and Compliance Initiative entitled to the members and stakeholders of the ECI community. Well, we've linked to all of those in the show notes, and um, uh, so you can take a look at them uh, for and consider for yourself. But uh, really, uh, kind of wondered uh, what your take might be on all of this. Well, I, I agree that it, it's been a, a stunning week, and just to uh, really see the the broad reaching uh, support of the. Um, you know, you're fighting for equality and, um, you know, equal treatment. And I think it's quite interesting that the charge was initially led by, um, business and the, you know, initial groups of CEOs who, uh, decided to bow out of, uh, the president's advisory committee and, uh, Soon he realized that when he was the member of a club that no one else wanted to join, uh, the president said that these, um, you know, advisory committees were not needed. So that's one interesting point, uh, how the business community has responded. Um, there, there's been uh, a little bit more of a bipartisan censure of the president for what he's done. And I didn't get to read the thing, but, you know, just as we were coming on air, I saw a flash saying that Mitt Romney has suggested to the president that he needs to get out and apologize to the American public. So, um, you know, this still is going to have a lot of mileage in it, but I've been uh, quite happy at the response by the ethics community and uh, by business leaders and um I just uh, last night uh, I had the opportunity to get together with Matt Kelly here in Boston, and we were just trying to, you know, figure out what where does this go? And uh, you know, there's I I, I first of all don't uh, see the the shorthand solution, and um, you know I, I'm very worried about what this weekend is going to hold. Uh, if there are going to be any further, um, you know, displays or any further protests uh, from the alt-right. So um, I, I still think this is a situation that's very much in flux, but I, I hope that we are, have been making progress with this week's events. So when I really see this, Jay, as um, important to business, but also good for business and um I think most listeners know that I often say that compliance is in large part a business response to a legal obligation. Certainly FCPA compliance is a response to the law, uh, the FCPA. And here we have a business response, which is policies of inclusion, policies of equality, policies of dignity at the workplace uh, to help foster a, a more productive business uh, atmosphere at your organization, and also foster uh, a company that others want to work for, and more importantly, want to do business with. So I see it. Uh, compliance is absolutely consistent with um, uh, the values that uh, the protesters uh, uh, wanted uh, that or that are against the, the values really of the white supremacists and uh, neo-Nazis, and that we can actually uh, do something positive for our organizations by uh, reaffirming um, our commitment to the corporate values that are generally stated in every corporate code of conduct, but certainly in their mission uh, values and uh, vision that are a part of all uh, corporations in the United States. So uh, I think the compliance uh, profession needs to take a stand. I certainly applaud the ECI for the stand they took. And I actually emailed Pat Harned yesterday and applauded her for, for doing it. So um, uh, I hope that uh, if you're listening to this, that you will consider some of these. And in your company, uh, really, it may be time for your company to, to reaffirm its values to its employees. I've uh, reviewed lots of statements by CEOs to their organizations, and um, they uh have emphasized that their corporate values are those uh, which are antithetical to those uh, groups that uh, 
led the uh, demonstrations in uh, Charlottesville. So I hope uh, corporate America will help lead this because we're certainly getting no leadership from the administration on this. Um, I think another interesting point that uh, Matt and I were discussing last night was just the um, uh, five uh, major uh, chiefs of, of the uh, armed forces all came out to with very strong statements um, that were against uh, racism and white supremacists and things like that. So it it really creates um, it, the the president's lack of sensitivity has really created a vacuum that the military, political leaders, and uh, the business community have all uh, you know stepped in to fill that vacuum. Uh, and the question is is uh, you know how does the president find a way out? And he just can't, uh, you know, keep hiding on golf courses. There, there needs to be, this, this is the 800 pound elephant and it needs to be addressed and it needs to be addressed soon. So that's, uh, I don't know if that's a positive, uh, upbeat wrap up, but, uh, I think that, uh, I guess for me, it was cathartic Jay to write my post today and to realize that, uh, you know, I too can stand up. You can stand up. If you're a compliance officer, all you have to do is stand up for the values that you're espousing every day. And that uh, by doing that, you re- reemphasize uh, what this nation really should stand for, which obviously is equality, dignity, and um, non-racial, uh, no racial hatred. So um, maybe on that note, Jay, uh, you could take us home from Boston. Sure. So from uh one of the initial cradles of liberty, that starting here in 1775, for Tom Fox, the compliance evangelist, and for myself, Jay Rose, and Mr. Monitor, uh, we thank you for joining us on this Friday. And as we do on every Friday, taking a look at the week that was an FCPA for the week ending August 18th, 2017. Um, please be safe. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of This Week in FCPA. If you have any questions, please feel free to email Jay at jrosen at affiliatedmonitors.com. You can reach me at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. If you have listened to this podcast on iTunes, we would greatly appreciate it if you would rate our podcast as it would help in our rankings and also get out the word about the only weekly FCPA compliance and ethics wrap up there is on the compliance podcast market. This is Tom Fox. Thanks again for listening, and I hope you'll join us again for another episode of This Week in FCPA, brought to you by the Compliance Podcast Network.